Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, welcome to our panel discussion titled Getting the U.S. Economy Working Again. My name's Amanda Cooper. I am the editor of the... And uh, being involved in technology, real estate, hospitality, among others. And uh, he is a chief mentor and founding director of uh, Incubator iCreate. We have with us also Rodri Laline, an expert in corporate governance, who is chairwoman of Intrabon Capital and a professor at the Amsterdam School of Real Estate. We also have Paul Sheard, who's an economist. He was previously uh, chief economist at Lehman Brothers, Nomura and S&P Global, and is currently research fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. We will be joined, hopefully, by our uh, fourth panelist, Bernard Moon, who's co-founder and partner at a uh, network of accelerators and uh, venture capital funds called Spark Lab. But I think he's running a little late, so hopefully he will be able to join us for this session. Now, as you'll see from your programs, um, the uh, agenda sort of looks at our session as uh, uh, you know, within the context of sort of following the inauguration of Joe Biden, um, the U.S. has to uh, retain its growth, uh, reposition the U.S. dollar. Um, what are the first vital steps for the new president to take and so on? However, I thought given the, uh, the, the wide range of views and experiences and backgrounds of our panelists, I thought I'll perhaps kick off a question with a question. Um, COVID has been the biggest economic shock. Uh, in modern history and uh, normal fiscal and monetary medicine hasn't worked. And as such, central banks and governments around the world have spent trillions of dollars on extraordinary measures to get the world going again. As 2021 has dawned, we've seen the rollout of a successful vaccination program that will hopefully pave the way towards not just the US economy reopening and returning to normal, but the global economy. Now, that has obviously been a game changer and the world finds itself at something of a tipping point as there are still plenty of headwinds um, in front of us. Um, Paul, I'd like to address the first question to you, actually. What, in your opinion, does uh, the, what kind of state is the global economy in now, uh, now that we've got vaccinations underway and recovery is seeming to take root? What's the, the likely trajectory that we're looking at? Thanks, Amanda, and uh, thanks very much for uh, moderating and hosting the session. I see some familiar faces in the audience, so welcome to everybody there as well. Um, well, the global economy is a big place, obviously, so um, you know the, the averages will hide a lot of variation beneath the surface. Perhaps I'll focus a little bit more on the U.S. as the still the kind of probably the most important economy in the world, but you know it. You can you can see a similar trend across the world, depending on how badly the pandemic hit. But I would make quick uh, three quick points by way of introduction. First is um, to just underscore Amanda the point you made about this being the biggest uh, economic shock. Uh, you know, economists talk in terms of negative shocks to aggregate demand or supply. You know, in 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 the modern era, it certainly dwarfs the Great Recession and the global financial crisis. If you just look at the data, some of the charts that you see literally are off the charts. You might think, if you didn't know the context, that there was a data input error or, or something like that. Um, you know, in the first half of last year, uh, in the U.S., GDP, real GDP, fell by 10.3 percent. Now, in the U.S., as you know, people quote uh, GDP numbers quarter and quarter uh, numbers in annual terms. That's a non-annualized number, 10.3%. Annualized would be, you know, 40 something percent. Unemployment, the unemployment rate, which is, you know, in some ways the, the uh, really the pulse of the economy and so important for people's livelihood, went up from 3.5% in February of last year to 14.8% two months later. So it went up something like 11, more than 11 percentage points in two months. Well, you know, benchmark that against the Great Recession. In the Great Recession, the unemployment rate went up uh, pre the big shock in September 2008 from 6.1%, and it hit a peak of 10%. But that took 14 months to go up about four percentage points. So the numbers are really, truly dramatic. In some, and of course, other economies, you know, the numbers can be a little bit different. Where they're most different is on the unemployment rate, interestingly. If you look at GDP numbers, people went down five, six, you know, 10%. Um, really, the 
stands out in terms of how much impact was also seen in the unemployment rate for you know, various reasons that we could go into. Second point I'd make is, well, this is bad news. This is the good news is that there has been you know, quite a recovery in GDP. So in the second half of last year in the US, real GDP went up something like 8.6%. That still leaves the level of GDP at the end of last year about 2.5% below where it was at the end of 2019. But we did see, we have seen, looking at the whole year, putting it together, and it's continuing in this quarter, um, a sort of a V-shaped recovery, where well, maybe three quarters or so on the upside of the V, although it seems to be flattening a little bit now. Um, Unemployment rates down to about 6.2%. And um, if you look at the stock market, for example, the S&P 500 is about 17% above its pre-COVID peak. So the stock market has improved even better than the economy. Reason for that, of course, is it's more forward-looking. And then the third point I'd, I'd make, just to go sort of tack back and, and balance a little bit, is that, you know, we're by no means out of the woods. And particularly, the situation is still very dire. any or very little exposure to financial markets and risk assets, you haven't really, at least directly, uh, been a beneficiary of that run-up in, uh, in the stock market and risk assets. Um, unemployment rate is still, as I said, 6.2%. That's you know, almost three percentage points above where it started. There's another measure of the unemployment rate which economists tend to look at. It's called the U6 measure. It's a, a measure of unemployment and underemployment, people who would like to work more or maybe are on the edges of the, of, of the labour market ready to come back in, <clears throat> pardon me, that number's 11.1%, so more than 10% of the workforce in the US. And that's about, uh, you know, more than three, a, a little, about four percentage points actually, a little bit more than where it was pre-crisis. So again, round number, 4% of, of the workforce you know, really is, is sitting on the sidelines waiting for things to get better. Not much to you there. So that underscores, Amanda, and I'll stop here, a point about this re recession is that there have been winners and losers, and I'm sure we'll hear more from, from the other panellists about that as we dig into the economy. But knowledge workers, you know, people who, who had exposure to the stock market, yeah, COVID's been, you know, a, a, a disrupting force, but it hasn't been devastating unless, of course, you've suffered from uh, on the health side of things. And, of course, that is very serious. But for many people, this has just been, you know, Great Depression territory. It's really devastating to people's mm -hmm. lives. So that does matter, you know, for the, the met thing that you mentioned at the beginning there of, of um, monetary, fiscal and other government policies, which maybe many of our you know, people don't need those policies, but there are people who desperately do need a support in these really historic and, and somewhat cruel times. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. I, 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 that was an incredibly complete and detailed answer. You did say before we got started that you're going to throw lots of numbers of it at us, but <laughs> it's, um, I think, for me, been very, very interesting to hear those numbers put into context and put into real terms, like how this has impacted people's lives. My next question, actually, is for you, Rodria. Paul was sort of talking about, you know, the impact on, on, you know, on the economy, the impact on human beings, and how the pandemic has created winners and losers. I mean, I think, is it sort of you know so sort of, you know looking at, at at the last sort of twelve months or so, um, it, it feels a little bit like that the pandemic has exposed the huge gap between the haves, the have-nots, human being, humankind's mm -hmm. impact on things like climate change, down to just just down to how companies have handled things like furlough policies and looking after their workers. Now. Um, you know, it feels also that investors and consumers, you know, are po probably accelerated by the pandemic, are putting more pressure on um, on companies and their boards and demanding that they be judged by tougher environmental, social and governance criteria. You know, what does this mean for corporates? Is there are we at the point where we're going to see are we at that sort of tipping point for the corporate world where we're on the cusp of seeing real change? Um how will the company sort of thrive in a, you know, as we shift towards a digital, um, you know, green economy? Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. And thank you also, Paul. Um, it was also good to hear yesterday um, a presentation of uh, the Fed. 
um, uh, Mr. Powell, and I think we indeed are, the pandemic is an historic uh, challenge indeed. Um, this morning, I listened to some of the sessions and at Horace's this morning, uh, some people talk, indeed talked also about the monetary and fiscal policies and multilateral institutional cooperation. So recovery, as Paul also said, depends on the spread of the virus and the speed of vaccine development and, and more of this. And lots of people obviously uh, are in pain because um, um, they lost their job. So we, we have to create jobs. And uh, yesterday I heard that about 10 million people have to find a new, new employment. And that's a lot of people to find new employment. So um, you can only do this if, uh, if you drive the process from a strong institutional base. So um, governance basically, uh, from a public point of view, it's well done here uh, because you have uh, uh, really credible organizations to do that, like the Fed. Um, there's lots of monetary policy in place, but the fiscal policy obviously is uh, absolutely important. And uh, uh, although lots of things have happened, um, we have to be very careful in how we look at that. Um, there is strong recovery, and that recovery hinge on, this, on certain sectors, particularly the sectors that are directly influenced, uh, where the vaccine can directly influence it. Um, we now need basically a sustainable, impactful investment, as you refer to, Amanda. Um, impactful investments may restart the economy, so they create jobs, push economies in a more green, a more inclusive, a more digital future. Um, the governance will help because you have these strong institutions. So obviously, um, the state of the economy is at the moment, as Paul said, a bit uncertain and depends on the course of the virus. 10 million people must go for work and therefore ESG investments, and you refer to the E of environment, the S of social and the G of governance, the impactful ESG investments are needed to take people back to work. Uh, developing people's skills and skills uh, in software development, also address social inequalities, create change, give better living standards. Um, but when you move in that area, there are three, you know, we, we, we look at an, uh, a diffuse taxonomy with regard to ESG investments. Um, first of all, we started uh, in the taxonomy of uh, investments uh, we started to think about exclusion investments. So you exclude, uh, avoid investing in unsustainable uh, corporates or countries based on screens or other ways to identify issues or et cetera. So you scan basically in which uh, companies uh, you are not investing. Um, then we moved from exclusion investment more to sustainable investments. So we call that inclusion investments. Then you need much more alignment of uh, the partners who really think uh, similar like you and those actively involved. And you see that in Europe, we already started to look at standards and say, are there standards that we all can support? Like uh, particularly, there's lots of growth and impact investments in, uh, and they are positive in real estate. So we look at is in the uh, built environment, are there standards to be developed like BREAM for uh, less CO2, better material, circular economy, etc. cetera. Um, make sure that we are doing the right thing and we are all aligned around the same de facto industry standards. There is a movement there, not yet uh, at the point that we all can say, you know, we can set standards at the moment. But uh, the third phase that is where we are in, which is much more difficult, is impactful investment where you pick stock and you do stock picking basically those seeking to have direct positive measurable impact on society and there you need metrics the metrics in sustainable and impactful investment is at the moment uh, and you know we are still developing it and we still have a long way to go but in any case esg topics investments will uh, nevertheless uh, restart this economy help people to get their jobs back and uh, basically, as long as we have a low uh, interest rates and uh, the, the, the Fed keeps it on an inflation because they expect an inflation because of the services that went down, services business, um, 
uh, they keep it on 2%, uh, then I think uh, everybody knows what to do for a longer term. And we can invest long term because uh, all of these things that I talked about, ESG investments, are long term investments in environmental investments, climate change, energy management, environmental impact, water use, sourcing, clean water, natural resources, biodiversity, less CO2 emissions. Uh, second, social. So it's health and safety, human rights, human capital management, data privacy. And last but not least, a very good governance. That means uh, have the right business ethics, uh, you know, have a good uh, one tier board and a good structure. Make sure that you are doing the things right. Um, make sure that you uh, don't go in that gray areas. This is what I want to say for the moment. Thank you. A lot, a lot of food for thought there. Um, I thought I'd like to um, bring uh, Parag into the uh, into the mix now. Uh, Rodrigo, when you were you know, running through your you know, very thorough look at um, the sort of the you know the challenges facing not just the corporate world but society as a whole about how to um, you know make meaningful change and where that starts and so on. Um, Parag, when we were sort of chatting yesterday, uh, you said. In adversity, we find opportunities. Now, as somebody who is an entrepreneur, who is there at, you know, has, has been there at the start from the ground up for a number of businesses, um, you know, this is a very, I hate saying very unique environment. It's a unique environment, the one in which we find ourselves right now for a number of reasons. But um, going back to what Roger was saying about in order to get the economy back on its feet again properly, what we need are, um, you know, yes, we've got the fiscal, the monetary on the one side, but what we need are impactful measures to kickstart the economy, you know, not just uh, you know, any, you know, right down to things like software development and so on. Now, someone that's kind of very deeply immersed in, you know, the world of technology, innovation, and so on. Um, how do, you know, where does this sort of uh, shift towards a, a well, I guess one way of putting it, perhaps a, a kinder, more mindful society, a more kind of kind, you know, more ESG focused corporate world. Sit with you. you know, what kind of opportunities does that throw up? What kind of challenges do you face? So, thank you, Amanda, for giving me this opportunity to speak, and uh, thanks to everybody that joined the session. Uh, uh, the panelists here are are amazing, and uh, you'll probably get a lot of value uh, from, from 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 our viewpoints. Um, I work pretty closely with uh, the Israeli and the Indian government, uh, all the way up to the office of the prime ministers in promotion of entrepreneurship, creation of job and creation of wealth. So let's just put a couple of things into perspective. Paul just mentioned we're, we're dealing with a 10 million uh, number unemployment here in the U.S. But well, India uh, is adding a million youth to the workforce every month for the next 27 years. So think about job creation. Right. The quantum of the problem set at hand is exponentially more difficult. So maybe there's a learning there. How is that government looking at job creation? It's not through going to large corporates. It's not going to uh, to the government agencies. Uh, it's basically promotion of entrepreneurship, uh, because if you can create one entrepreneur who then can he or she can create 20 jobs, then you have cut the quantum of job creation by a multiple of 20. So it's a lot easier for any government to promote entrepreneurship. 80% of U.S. employment comes from small businesses. It does not come from Microsofts and Googles and Amazons of the world. So they, to, to kind of nurture them, mentor them, give them platforms to excel and succeed is your, your ticket to creation of jobs in mass. So that, that's pretty much what India is embracing. They have dedicated close to $2.5 billion dollars in the government kitty to be given the promotion of entrepreneurship, right? So that, that, that's number one. So if we look at growth through the prism of uh, entrepreneurship, a uh, lot of things fall into place uh, because to, to kind of bring up one Amazon or one Facebook, uh, and I'm obviously my, my referrals are tech centric because that's where my knowledge base comes from. Uh, it's very difficult to create under Microsoft. But it's not that difficult to create 50 other small entrepreneurs that can hire 10 to 15 people each. Uh, and, and they need people from all strata of society. It's not that they only need programmers. They need receptionists. They need legal help. They need uh, uh, accountants. They need lo lo le uh, across the spectrum. They need all kinds of help. So that's number one. Number two, I think the previous administration that just left the U.S., 
focus very heavily on America first. So we we were we were uh, global uh, maybe about a decade ago, and then we became local for the last four years. And I think now in the U.S., it's time for us to become global. This whole mindset of that I just have to look after myself is not really going to get us somewhere. And let me put things into perspective, right? Uh, I don't know how many of you know about an Italian brand called Armagilda Zenia, but Zenia creates uh, fashion design, and um, spe- specifically for men, they, they make suits that are in the range of $3,000 to begin with. Now, Zenia uh, in Manhattan has one store. I live in Philadelphia. They have another one in Cherry Hill. So in my demographic, there are two Zenia stores if I wanted to buy a Zenia suit. So th- roughly speaking, broadly speaking, 300 million people in the U.S., 10% of them can afford Xenia, so that brings you down to 30 million. Uh, 10% of them probably know of Xenia, that brings you down to 3 million. That's what Xenia's customer base now is in the US. Let's flip that a little. Think about India, 1.2 billion people. 10% of them, believe it or not, can afford Xenia. That's 120 million. Let's assume same dynamic, 10% know of Xenia, that's 12 million. So if you get a suit made here in Manhattan by Xenia, it takes you three months to get it. That same suit in India is about seven months. The point I'm trying to make here is markets are global. And if you don't see them as such, then you're going to miss out on a tremendous opportunity. So this thing about America first, I'm going to keep everything inert and inward facing is not the ticket to getting out of where we are. Uh, and, and, And that's true for pretty much everything. Right. So a couple, couple of thematics that come out of here. If if you are somebody that can pivot, I mean, think about it. There are a lot of companies that are making N95 masks. You can't find them. There are people that are making hand sanitizers, individually packed foods. That business didn't exist. Well, right now they're thriving. Right. Uh, the signs that you see everywhere that say six feet apart, that business didn't exist. Whoever's making those are overnight millionaires. So people and companies that are willing to pivot is where life opportunity and adversity principle comes in. They will succeed, they will grow, and they'll grow exponentially. Uh, Companies that are willing to look at markets outside of their comfort zone uh, will again uh, get our economy rolling and, and, and moving. And broadly speaking, if we as a society started focusing back on empowering the businesses at the lowest strata of society, uh, then then our growth uh, gets gets kick started much quicker, uh, rather than just focusing on the on the top heavy enterprises. Uh, the governments are there to make sure tech doesn't do this, and there's no monopoly created there. That's why we have the SEC, and that's why we have the Fed to regulate what what the broader economy does. But broadly speaking, that doesn't really apply to the local restaurateur, right? What what the Fed does with the rates, I don't really believe makes a huge difference in somebody that's running a mom and pop shop. So, but they are the ones that will get back us rolling. So that's where I'll leave it for, for, for discussion, taking it forward from here. But that, that's my broader viewpoint. Right. Yeah. Um, thank you, Parag. I, I very much like, I think I'm going to borrow your, uh, your the term local. I think that's a, a, a great way of putting it. Um, yeah, I think like, you know, obviously one of the circling back to the initial sort of, uh, you know, theme of this conversation was about kind of getting the economy going again and so on and you know what happens now under the new administration i think what you were saying about you know this 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 situation it's exactly the opposite um with that in mind um paul if i can come back to you on on sort of uh you know the kind of the big picture uh you know where we are with the economy kind of thing um you know what the u.s economy is what about sort of $20 $20 trillion in size now. It's the world's largest. It's like a giant oil super tanker. And, and things don't just pivot, the, you know, overnight just because, you know, one administration has departed and another has has started. I mean, you know, given the, the kind of what, you know, we're hearing from Rodria, what we're hearing from Prague, this very kind of ground up approach that it's going to take to really get, you know, recovery underway. And, you know, there's stimulus checks as they may make their way to people's actual pockets. Um, is it fair to say it doesn't really matter who's in charge? Uh, well, 
to a certain extent, U.S. pass. I, I would agree with that, uh, actually, Amanda. And yeah, again, as a, as a sort of a, the, the economist is often the kind of the party pooper in the room, uh, pointing out these inconvenient facts. And um, as somebody who originally came to the United States from elsewhere, Australia, so I'm American citizen, but also came from Australia and Australian citizen, you sometimes see things a little bit differently. And you know, a point I've made literally for for a couple of decades is if you look at the U.S. political system um, and, and Washington, everybody likes to rag on Washington, um, you know, with some justification, obviously. Uh, politicians are not, are not saints. Um, but um, if you look at policy, go back to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, you know, policy really hardly missed a heartbeat going from the Bush administration to the Obama administration in terms of the mobilization of monetary policy, fiscal policy, and financial system policy. And I can remember having, you know, pointing this out to people at, at the time and subsequent to that. And, you know, a common, a common refrain, Amanda, was, that, well, that was then, but now things have changed. Things have become so hyper-partisan. If you read American history, um, you will find way back to the founding of the, of the, of the uh, country, things are hyper-partisan and, you know, you know, we could go through the whole the whole history. So this is nothing new at all. And I think we saw it again, frankly speaking, uh, in this round. I mean, you could not get a more ostensibly hyper-partisan environment than the last, the one of the last couple of years. And yet, um, you know, we had the CARES Act last year, which was a, a massive fiscal policy. We've got this new 1.9 trillion. Now, admittedly, you know, very few Republicans, maybe one or maybe zero, um, you know, voted for that. But that again was, you know, they knew that that was going to get through. If they'd been in the, in, in the driving seat, they probably would have looked at the situation. Composition probably would have been different. But I just don't see, you know, huge differences, you know, because faced with an economy that's in the tank, both sides of the political aisle have an incentive to get get moving again. And the other ingredient, which is very important to, to emphasize, of course, is that much of the responsibility for managing the macro economy, um, you know, providing support for aggregate demand through fiscal and monetary policy, making sure the financial system is in good shape, etc., and that falls on the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, like uh, central banks all around the world these days, is you know, is an independent technocratic entity and society collectively has decided this is the best way to run the macro economy. Now, monetary policy does need fiscal support from time to time, particularly in crisis times. But typically it's the job of the Fed. People look at the Fed, what are you doing with interest rates? What are you doing now with quantitative easing? The Fed has taken its balance sheet from about three trillion dollars a year ago to now seven and a half trillion. It's hardly been sitting on the sidelines twiddling its thumbs and it's come out with an array of programs. Um, and that's, but that's, that's not Republican. It's not Democrat. It's the Federal Reserve. So yes, I mean, you led the witness there. Um, I will, I will agree with the proposition. Of course, you can dig into the details and people will argue, or particularly maybe when it comes to some social policies, some of the things that have already been raised. Uh, maybe there is a regulatory state, how you run the regulatory state. There are definitely nuances across the political aisle, but by and large, um, everybody's incentives are aligned to get this economy, <coughs> pardon me, moving and moving as strongly as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just, uh, you know, you're talking about the, you know, the, the Federal Reserve and, and, and the central bank's role just now in kind of getting things going and greasing the wheels and keeping the financial system from collapsing, essentially. Um, Roger, if I can just come back to you for a minute, when you were talking about those, uh, you know, you're sort of saying that from a, you know, governance, at least from a, from a, you know, a public perspective is, is, is very, uh, is, uh, solid in the United States that you've got very credible organizations like the Federal Reserve kind of in charge of certain, you know, you know aspects of, of, you know, running the economy and so on. Um, when you were talking, you know, you turn them more to kind of fiscal policy and you're talking about some of those you know, impactful measures that the economy needs. Could you give us some examples perhaps of the kind of things that you would like to see or that, you know, you feel um, need to happen in order to just you know, get those 10 million that are unemployed back into work and get the, like, when we talk about the economy, getting real people back on their feet. Thank you, Amanda. Ask, uh, asking this question, I will respond to it in a minute, but I was a bit uh, challenged by what uh, Barack said. Um, first of all, um, I really think we go for, um, you know, looking at Paul, to higher inflation. From a fiscal policy point of view, we see, and that's re as a response to um, to Barack, we see reduced global competition. We see deglobalization. 
not globalization, deglobalization. We see higher production costs and prices. So the pandemic is a negative shock to the services industry, basically. So when you talk about fast fashion, um, well, it might be that you are looking for better value change, but we are withdrawing at the moment from this whole global area. Um, we, we see that our contact intensive services will cost more. Deglobalization also means the dismantling of the value chains. Production shifted to higher cost areas. Reduced competition means firms basically to raise prices when domestic cyclical pressures increase. So reduced global specialization means less offshoring, more bargaining power for the workers here, and then with more resilient supply chains and cost goes up. So we see therefore this higher inflation and the Fed is saying, yes, it will go and go up. And we make sure that, uh, you know, we control that very he heavily. But also in response to what to do then next uh, with regard to ESG, I think we really have to look in the pivoting that Parak talked about. We are look, have to look at four quadrants. The first quadrant is a quadrant where we basically all sit down and think about value propositions, have smart input. So what are we going to do with our artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, circular economy, digital transformation, green economy? So we, we come up with smart ideas and therefore have, uh, we go for defining ESG and what it means for an organization. So we basically use company products and services to anchor the company's definition of ESG. So we come up with value propositions. The second, so we need for this an entrepreneurial mindset, and therefore, Parak, you're in good shape to do that. Um, secondly, um, we therefore need also not only in the what space, but in the second quadrant, the how space. So we need to define the business process, the business model, business model innovation, how much finance, what the IT structure is to support it. And therefore, we then need value delivery and architectural mindset, you know, looking at smart output. The third quadrant is the quadrant where we are saying we also need uh, governance uh, and in organizations where we address the purpose, uh, the existence of this organization. So a purpose is very important because it defines also the culture that you're working in. And therefore, uh, the third quadrant has to do with the relationships that you build, either with your employees, with your alliances, with your partners. So there you capture that value and you look for talents to come in and you show your stewardship in this uh, ESG. And the last thing is when you make, uh, when you make the path uh, um, through the three circles, uh, through the three quadrants that I mentioned, you arrive at the last quadrant where you need a director mindset. While in the third quadrant, you need a conductor mindset to look at all, you know, get all that expertise in and conduct that as an uh, as a orchestra uh, where uh, people that you hire are better than yourself and you are, you are making the music with them. In the director uh, quadrant, there is where you look at creating, you know, uh, confirming the value basically and appropriate that. And then you see what you've done wrong or what you can improve and that creates a change. So in the fourth quadrant, you look at strategy and change. I see people with business cards. I am a strategy, I mean strategy, I'm chief strategist, strategist, but that's nothing if you don't know what, how to change and make changes and how you do that uh, uh, very well. So then you close the circle uh, basically in the fourth quadrants, because if you make the change, you are back to value propositions. Closing the circle means that you pivot. If you accelerate and pivot, you can do that very fast. And Zara is doing that 20 times a year um, uh, in the fashion industry. I was the chairperson of a, uh, a board in, in textile, and we had uh, lots of factories in uh, Bangladesh and, uh, and Vietnam, etc. And we saw that we spoiled too much CO2, too much water, uh, greenhouse effects. Uh, we did lots of things wrong and we got lots of NGOs saying to us, do it, do it different. So back to the point that I want to make. If you therefore look at which sectors are important now to invest in, well, I, I basically uh, would say there are three big sectors 
Um, you could uh, have defensive investments like uh, uh, consumer defensive or health care of soft utilities. I mean, those things are very important, particularly because we have this pandemic. So the COVID-19 vaccine and other thing that relate to health care is important when you look at these defensive investments. But uh, uh, you see that more and more people uh, investing in bonds, sorry, investing in stocks are going for cyclical, cyclical investments like materials, consumer discretionary financial services, and particularly where I teach at school, and that's at the university, uh, I'm a professor in real estate. And real estate and uh, the built environment at the moment is very important because uh, impact investments strive there for positive impact. You see that um, there is uh, lots, there's 114 billion investment uh, asset, uh, asset under management in 2017 and that will according to Deloitte uh, in real estate will go up to one trillion dollars so that's that's a huge uh, so in the cyclical in, uh, investments I basically say you know I go for uh, things that are greener electric power generation uh, copper lithium metals all all kind of greener electricity generations uh, even toilet paper, right, is uh, as a consumer staple in cyclical investments is, is something that's interesting. But um, when the economy uh, opens up, then we obviously need investments in restaurants, restaurants that begin investing in digital technologies, inventory management, uh, mobile apps, etc. cetera. Um, I would not look at financial, uh, honestly speaking, but real estate indeed. Um, and last but not least, there's another sector that's important. Um, it's a sensitive uh, investments, as we call them. It's in communications. It's in uh, e-commerce platforms. It's in energy. It's in the industrials. And particularly, you know, industrials, when you look at manufacturing, you would like to invest in finished goods or in clean water, water infrastructure, water software platforms. Amanda, I would uh, conclude this with the simple fact that we really need to invest in this kind of ESG we really need the, the metrics to do that, and we really need the digital uh, transformations in the organizations to make this all possible. We can't hear you. Your no, I can't hear you. I do apologize. I was on mute. Very 2019 of me. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for that very, very, again, very, very detailed rundown looking at um, not just the four uh, you know, the, the quadrants that, 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 you know, you need to kind of that to the, the kind of enable that that sort of ability that kind of create that ability to pivot but also looking like now as things sound right now what sectors look attractive where you know especially if you're you're investing more from a kind of an ESG kind of transformational point